I'm the founder of Mycosymbiotics. Mycosymbiotics is an environmental research business based in New Cumberland, Pennsylvania that I started in 2015. I made it one of my priorities to um, achieve some sort of balance with my local ecology and the community around me. Hey everybody, it's William Padilla Brown from Mycosymbiotics coming at you with the second harvest from our commercial Cordyceps Militaris grow here. Um, cordyceps lends itself in two desirable ways to humanity, as an aphrodisiac and then for the energy on a cellular level that doesn't have that same crash like caffeine does. And also they can be found at high altitudes. I found um, cordyceps at some of the highest altitudes in North America um, and they can increase the amount of oxygen that's in our blood. But I think as more people start to understand its, uh, its role, I think that uh, it'll have all sorts of use in a, in a new world of, of a molecular industry. I just think that it's important to encourage citizen science and, you know, um, public acts of citizen science. I don't know, I think I'm just a good representation as like a, a high school dropout, like brown skinned person doing science. Shows that it's really approachable. And the more people that are doing it, the more that we're gonna uncover, the more research that we're gonna find, and the more practical applications of science that we're gonna find. Today we're going to be preparing substrate for cultivating cordyceps mushrooms. Basically what we're doing is we're creating a matrix, something for the mushroom fungus to grow on, which is the rice. The rice is a solid state matrix. It's something for the mycelium to live on. And then we're enriching that matrix with supplements, um, you know, because cordyceps grow in the wild on nutritious bugs. So we kind of want to recreate that nutrition for them so they can produce all those beautiful compounds that we like. Um, and it doesn't really take a big fancy lab or anything like that. Whenever I first learned how to grow it, I was just doing it in like a box in my house. Um, um, there's information and t t uh, tutorials online on how to uh, set everything up with just a uh, Instant Pot. So, I mean, really with the small investment of an Instant Pot and a clean space in your house, you can start doing everything that we're doing right now. Uh, we're gonna start with a nutrient broth. And the base of our nutrient broth is going to be coconut water today. Um, a lot of times we'll use water, um, but coconut water has potassium in it that is also very beneficial for cordyceps. So we're just gonna rock out with some of this coconut water today. One of the other very important ingredients we're going to need is some tapioca starch. Um, the starch is really important. Um, it breaks down into sugars, which the uh, mushrooms then use as a carbon source to actually create uh, their bodies. We have some magnesium sulfate, which just acts as a mineral supplement. Um, and for the rest of our mineral supplementation, um, sometimes I'll use rock dusts, um, but you can totally use uh, crushed one-a-day vitamins. We have our brown rice to act as a uh, matrix for our mycelium to grow on. And we have soy peptone. So soy peptone and nutritional yeast can be used in replacement for one another. Um, more labs may have access to soy peptone. This isn't something that you can just go find at a grocery store where you could find nutritional yeast at a grocery store. We have some kelp powder here. Um, this is great for macro micronutrients and minerals. Um, so this is great for a mineral supplement, macronutrients, micronutrients, and this just helps to make sure that our cordyceps grow healthy um, and produce all the compounds that we want from them. Last but not least, we have some gypsum. Uh, we use this for the same reason we use gypsum for all uh, other mushrooms, to add a little bit of calcium, magnesium, and uh, add a little bit of rigidity and structure to the mushroom. Here we have some of the tools of the trade. We've got some polyfill. We're gonna utilize this for making some uh, filters on our lids for our jars, which we will be utilizing for fruiting some of the mushrooms. Um, we have a nice little spoon here for aiding in mixing things. A smaller spoon for measurement. Uh, we have some culture here. We're gonna use that later. Um, and got a nice little scale, a little skiz here for measuring out our dry materials um, that we're gonna be adding into our broth. Um, and then we have a nice little scale scoop uh, for measuring out our materials for our broth. Like a nice little vessel for mixing and a tool for mixing as well, like this whisk here. Um, you could also, you could also uh, use a blender, put all of your dry materials after you weigh them into a blender with your liquid, blend it up, and then use it like that. Um, but you know, this gives you a nice feel for it. Um, and if you wanna hit them with some of that biodynamic, mix a little to the left, mix a little to the right underneath the moonlight, you know, that's the way to do it. All right, well, let's get into it. I'm 
start um, introducing the dry ingredients and uh, mixing them up into solution with the coconut water. Um, so I'm gonna put the dry ingredients in here first. All right guys, so we got all of our dry ingredients here and um, we're gonna go ahead and start adding in this coconut water. Get everything unstuck from the bottom there. There we go. Feast upon the weird powders. All right guys, if you have any um, pesky clumps in there, you might wanna grab an immersion blender or instead of using a whisk, you can just invest in an immersion blender for your setup. That's fun. I'm not even gonna front, I was doing that longer because I was having fun with it. All right guys, we are going to prepare some lids here for uh, filtration. Um, so one of the things that I would like to uh, note is that whatever your hole size that you're going to drill into your lid uh, should be big enough for your needle to go in uh, that you're gonna be utilizing when you inoculate your substrate. Um, so I like to use an 18 gauge, one and a half inch needle. Um, so you're gonna wanna make sure that whatever you're drilling into your lid is at least bigger than 18 gauges. Simple as that. And we're gonna take a little bit of this polyester fiber. Um, one of the tricks that I've learned over the years is that if you get acrylic fiber yarn, um, you can take a crochet hook and you can pull it through more than one of these lids at once with a crochet hook. You might even be able to take the polyester fiber, but the yarn, um, you're able to get a nice solid piece through um, more than one at once. Um, so if you're gonna be making a lot of these, um, you might want to try the acrylic yarn. It works just as well as the polyester fiber. There you go. And all you need is just a little bit of that to get nice and tight through there. And we have a nice little filter for our cordyceps to breathe. And we can also introduce our culture through there. All right, guys, we're uh, measuring out 46 mils of uh, broth here, and we're gonna measure out 28 grams of rice per pint jar. And that's ready to go right into the pressure cooker. All right, we're gonna load up our jars uh, into the Insert for the All-American. We're gonna be using an All-American today, um, but you can use whatever pressure cooker you have at home. Whenever I started out, I started with a Presto. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you can at least get 10 PSI, that means pounds per square inch. Um, you can look that up online, what your pressure cooker's capabilities are. Um, but you're gonna want at least 10 PSI for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Um, if you're getting contaminations, you're gonna want the longer times. Um, with the All-American, because we can go to 15 PSI, I'm gonna run this for 45 minutes and we're gonna get this thing loaded up. research right now that is, you know, what I believe to be pretty cutting edge that shows um, two active compounds of cordyceps, militaris, cordycepin, and cordymin um, are capable of inhibiting HIV-1 reverse transcriptase. Um, 
for a natural product to be able to inhibit the HIV virus from replicating is, empower, is incredibly powerful. Um, and I think that there's gonna be a lot more eyes looking at it. And I think that um, as we have more eyes looking at it and as we start to develop the analytical protocol for it, we're gonna start to discover a host of other compounds in it. You know, I'm really excited to see where holistic medicine goes, where we start to, when we start to realize that every single body is different and treat every body different instead of giving every body the same pills and every body the same dose for the same medicines when every body is different. So one of the methods we're gonna run is the Instant Pot technique, uh, which is way easier for beginners to get into if you haven't practiced any other kind of mycology or if you just wanna focus on cordyceps only. Instant Pot is a great technique to lock into. Um, so we're gonna separate a liter um, or a thousand mils by separating two 500s out and uh, putting it into our Instant Pot. All right guys, uh, we have here the insert for our Instant Pot. So we're going to mix the things that we're gonna, are gonna go in there into here. Um, and all that's gonna go in there is our rice, and our broth. All right, and it's important to weigh the rice out and make sure the measurements are accurate um, when you're preparing your cordyceps substrate because too much rice or too much liquid um, can end up with your substrate not having enough moisture or being too saturated. Not having enough moisture, your mycelium won't grow, too saturated bacteria will grow. All right guys, we're just gonna set this in the Instant Pot and uh, run it for the rice setting. So um, we have our Instant Pot all done um, and the uh, All-American is all done sterilizing. So we're gonna go prep uh, the flow hood area and preparations for um, introducing our liquid culture to our substrate. All right guys, so we have our jars uh, sterilized and cooled down and we're gonna take them out of the pressure cooker insert here. And you see the rice is nice and cooked. There is a little bit of moisture in there, but that's okay. You don't want too much standing water, but you want a little bit of excess moisture, um, which is going to provide the mushrooms with their humidity inside of the jar as they grow. When you receive your culture, you're going to want to remove the cap and quickly attach your sterile needle. And when you first open your needle, it's sterile, so you can go directly into a jar. And you're going to want to introduce about one to two mils in a circular rotation through your jar. Then remove the needle and set that aside. Um, you can sterilize your needle in a back incinerator or with a flame. I'm going to go ahead and stick it in the back incinerator. And now that it's sterile, I can go ahead and insert it in through one of these injection ports here. And the same, introduce two mils in a circular rotation. And this allows the mycelium to be distributed so you can see it grow out in a broader uh, fashion. All right, for the amount of uh, substrate that we made in the Instant Pot, I'd recommend at least 120 mils, um, at most 300 mils of liquid culture. Um, and then you can mix up your uh, liquid culture into the rice. All right, I'm gonna clean up my spoon here. I'm gonna make sure you got like a stainless steel or something like that. I'm gonna clean it up with this uh, diluted ethanol or isopropyl and make sure that uh, that your solution is dried up your uh, sterilization solution your ethanol or your isopropyl is dried before you stick it in there to mix it up so that you're not uh, killing your mycelium now we're just mixing our liquid culture in We don't need uh, too big of a layer, like no more than a half inch. 
if you pile it in too much, you're gonna be uh, reducing the amount of space you have for your fruits to grow. So if you have a culture that has really tall fruiting bodies and you put too much rice, they're not gonna be able to grow as much in there. So because this one doesn't have a rubber seal, um, but it does have these clips, I'm just gonna let it clipped and uh, put it in dark incubation. If you have a rubber seal, um, what I would recommend doing is putting a hole and putting a filter patch on it. If you have uh, a tub that doesn't have clamps, that just has a lid that clicks on, I would recommend not using that at all um, because there's gonna be too much airflow. If you run your whatever bins that you get, if you run them and you're noticing that it's drying out, um, you may wanna try uh, putting a line of tape to kind of create your own gasket or maybe search for one that has a gasket. Um, I've, I've had plenty of success with just putting a line of tape around and no filter. So yeah, we're gonna set this in a dark space to incubate over the next three days. Uh, incubation should be in the dark. Cordyceps are very photosensitive um, and they'll start to change the color of their mycelium when exposed to light. Um, generally, with a healthy culture, it'll take about three to six days for uh, the mycelium to grow through the substrate. And then after that, you will introduce it to light and you're gonna to wanna to keep the environment about 65 degrees from incubation time until harvest. Harvested in cordyceps is like a little nuanced. Um, you're gonna have to like do it a couple times and know your strain because it's going to produce parathesium on the top of the stroma. Parathesium are technically the fruiting body and the stroma is like means of the fruiting body not being in the dirt. Like the, stro like the, the little finger looking cordyceps thing that you see, there's bumps on the top of it. Those bumps are the fruits. The whole finger thing is just a fungal stretch. Of, of fungal material for the fruiting bodies to be in the air. Um, so when those come out and they, those get mature, that's when it's ready to harvest. After those are mature, then it starts to die. So like you're looking for the little bumps on the top to get ripe, <laughs> which just like takes a while to know what you're looking at. You can store them in ethanol um, for you know extracts or just for preservation. Um, you can store them in vinegar, you know, for extracts or just for preservation. Um, or you can dehydrate them um, and you know just store them in a container in a dark with silica packets. Um, and then make teas or foods or um, extracts or whatever. The most common contaminant is going to be Calcarosporium cordycepicola, uh, which is some sort of fungus that lives inside of the cordyceps and exposes itself when the conditions aren't ideal. So usually when it's too warm. Um, anything like above like 68, 69 um, for any long extended period of time, you'll probably start to see this white fuzz growing on top of your orange mycelium or growing on top of your cordyceps. Um, so that's the most common thing. Um, and then just general bacteria and molds that you're gonna be encountering in any kind of mycology. Um, and mites, um, if you get mites, they like to go in and out of the jars and eat your mycelium. Um, so you'll see patches in the mycelium. Um, mites aren't common if you're not doing wild culturing. If you're just growing only fruiting bodies in lab and stuff like that, you might never ever get mites. I definitely encourage people to follow me on Instagram. That's where I post a lot of really cool information. That's Mycosymbio. Um, you can also check out Mycosymbiotics. Um, Mycofest every August, first weekend of August. It's our festival that we host. That's a lot of fun for people to get engaged with. Um, Mycosymbiotics.net has good information. Uh, Apex Grower on YouTube has a lot of good information. Um, and if anybody wants to support us monetarily, um, I'm on Patreon as Permaculture Poppy, or you can check the link in my bio on my Instagram just for general donations. All the links are down below. Let's grow.